I'll be reading verses 1 through 3. May God bless the reading of his word, and may it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be called light and salt in a dark world. To be reflections in the world to those who are perishing and walking in darkness to those who are, we are the smell of death, that we are witnesses of Jesus Christ, to Jesus Christ, the aroma of Christ to them. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would cause us to reflect Christ more in our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Christian life is likened to a race. And Paul says that we should run to win. How many of y'all feel like running a marathon today? (laughs) No. (laughs) No. I don't feel like running a race either. There goes a lot. There's a lot involved in running such an enduring, difficult challenge. Paul said, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Paul's not speaking about a physical race as I just mentioned. Paul's talking about a spiritual race. Now, how many of y'all feel like running a spiritual race? That's a little bit different, isn't it? Running a spiritual race doesn't require physical energy. It it requires spiritual energy, spiritual strength. Metaphorically, Paul uses the common illustration of a running a race to encourage the Christians in the book of Hebrews. Well, Paul's not the author here of the book of Hebrews, but he does use this metaphor, this illustration as a race He uses it in the book of Acts. He uses it in the book of Galatians. He uses it in the book of Corinthians. He uses it in the letter to Timothy. And even here, the author of Hebrews uses that same illustration of running a race 
to describe the Christian life, the spiritual race of endurance, of perseverance, even though hardships should befall us or even erect themselves before us. A long time ago, the concept of a marathon, I don't know if y'all know the, the background to this uh, idea, but there's actually a store in the mall called Pheidippides. Have y'all ever heard of that? Uh, uh, the Greek uh, athlete Pheidippides. Pheidippides, he had to run three or four days from Athens to Sparta and then back to Marathon to get heart uh, help for the Spart from, against the, from the Spartans against the Persian army that was attacking Greece at that time. He ran a couple hundred miles. That's quite the endurance feat. But that's where the concept of the marathon came from. And this whole concept of uh, the Olympics, which, you know, uh, Los Angeles, I think, is in the top five for a couple years, uh, or actually in 2025, I think, is the date that they're, or 24, that they're trying to get in there and get the Olympics to come to America once again. This whole concept of, of the Olympics and this, uh, uh, the endurance racing goes predates all the way back before Jesus Christ. That's pretty incredible when you think 500 years before Christ, 490 years before Christ was when Pheidippides ran this race. It's nothing new. It was happening uh, and they were participating for hundreds of years before Christ even came. In the Greek uh, traditions, of running races, preparing for these races uh, was, a, was evident and known and well known through all societies. You would see young people, young men and soldiers uh, preparing for the races, doing such crazy things as doing long jumps. And that's something, that's where the long jump comes from. They would put weights on their ankles to make them strong so that when they would do these long jumps, it would be difficult, but they would take the weights off and they would feel like they were flying, like mercury. Or they would put leg uh, weights upon their feet and jump over hurdles. But then when they took the weights off, they could jump high and over uh, the greatest obstacle. That's what it's like running a race. We've got to learn how to get over hardships like hurdles in life. And we've got to learn how to jump far and high and wide to overcome. So the author of Hebrews says here that we've got to learn to persevere through hardships. He says a little bit further down in chapter 12, verse 7, endure hardship. I'm only focusing on verses 1 through 3. But this race that we are running, uh, running and persevering race through difficulties and over trials and through trials which are God's means to cause us not only to be refined but to discipline us to make us stronger. We should do this first of all because we're being watched. He says in our text here Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, as we run this race, people are watching. Now, the author here is not talking specifically about um, people who are witnessing our lives today, because previously in chapter 11, he's talking about the great hall of fame of the faithful. These people who are living their lives and giving up their lives and walking and running by faith, he says here even in verse 32, what more should I say? I didn't have time to talk about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, quenched the fiery flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weaknesses were turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign ar armies, 
He's not talking about Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Joseph or Moses. Just those folks. Those are a great cloud of witness who went before. Those people set the standard of running the race and persevering. No, it's not just those people that we're living our lives for. These people in the book of Hebrews were to endure as uh, part of the family, as the baton is being passed on to them, just like the people before you ran, so you should run. No, it's not just them. They were supposed to be a witness to the people around them. The great cloud of witnesses encompasses not only the people from the past who went before them, but the people who are watching. Who are the people who are watching? Both the righteous and the unrighteous. The people in the church who are going to be encouraged to persevere even when they're tempted to give up hope and despair even of life. The people in the book of Hebrews are being encouraged to be a light and salt. To be an example, an illustration of perseverance and endurance to the other Christians. So that when they see your faith, their faith, the other Christians would be encouraged to endure the suffering, the persecutions that might come their way. It's also a witness to the unrighteous. Those people who were witnessing their lives for the first time and seeing the light of Christ through their suffering and persecution. You see, the world sees hope when they see you with joy, a Christian joy, a joy that they don't know amidst difficulties. They are witnessing something different about you. I read in the, well, I heard about in the news last week, I believe it was, they were talking about the 25 attributes of the modern man. And the modern man, I think it might have been Sean Hannity or someone like that who was uh, snidely remarking about how the modern man he cries. But he made the point that those soldiers on the train in France, they didn't cry when those Muslims, those terrorists, were going to take over the train. No, those three soldiers, American soldiers, they took situations and matters in their own hands and they charged after those Muslim terrorists. They weren't crying they were warriors and they fought after them. They were proud and they were strong and they were not afraid. They did not cower. You see, the world thinks that the modern man, he, it's okay to cry and be afraid. To be with the women and not protect the women, but to be with the women. You know, and the Titanic, it was chivalrous and it was a it was representative of the time that manly men gave up their lives. I saw even, uh, you know, there was an old uh, uh, video of a man taking off his jacket and laying it in a puddle for a woman to cross the street to the sidewalk. You know, those times of men being chivalrous and being manly men and protecting women are a thing of the past almost because of women's equality, gender equality. Now women want to get into battle and fight with men. They want to have all the equal, equal, equal rights to the point of bathrooms not being, they're, be, they're unisex bathrooms. They're not gender specific any longer. Men are not men and women are not women any longer. And in this type of world, Christians need to stand up. Not, godly men need to stand up and represent a godliness to the world that shows a firmness, that shows a control and a courage 
And that even though they might be afraid, they stand in the day and in the hour. They stand in the face of the enemy. They stand up for the truth and for what is right. They do not cower. And while the world would say that it's okay for men to cower, they see an example by those who are not afraid, by men who have their eyes fixed on Jesus Christ and realize that their lives have been purchased by the blood and they have nothing to fear in this world. But they have everything to gain to protect their loved ones and those who need to be protected, to even offer up their lives. The world sees that and recognizes the truth. Even though they will not confess it, they see the difference because it contrasts their weakness. It makes them realize that they are afraid of standing up that they lack a courage that these people who are standing have. So you see, the great cloud of witnesses are not only the people who withstood in that hour in the past, but we are witnesses today. Witnesses of Jesus Christ, not only to those who might be afraid and don't know where to turn and how to be, but we're also witnessing being a witness to the ungodly, those people who do not know the truth. And we're setting an example for the people in the future as well. Just as Fox's Book of Martyrs, just as we can hear testimonies of the early church, and just as we can hear testimonies of Christians today who endure persecution, we are witnesses to the future progeny, to those people who are coming after us. We're setting examples by reputation of what it means to stand up for Christ when we have to face persecution. But you know, to be a witness is not something, to be a spiritual witness now, not just, remember, this race that we're racing is a spiritual race. Not a physical race per se. Not a physical marathon. It's our lives living for Christ. They require training. To run this race, to run to win, as I mentioned earlier, remember Paul said, run in such a way as to get the prize. To run the, and win the race, we have to go into strict training. <clears throat> Paul said, as well, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we get it to get a crown that will last forever. James uh, remarked in chapter 1, verse 12, uh, 12 of the book of James, Blessed are those who endure temptation, for when they have tried, they will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who endure, who persevere. This crown that James was referring to, and that even Paul is referring to, that those who are enduring and who are going into strict training, they are going to get a crown of salvation. This salvation, this gift of salvation, will last forever. That's what we're training for. That's what we're running the race for. For the, the fulfillment of this gift of this crown of life, this gift of salvation that God has given to us as a deposit and is going to come to fruition in a future day when we either go to be with Him or Jesus comes again. How do we run that race? We go into strict training to endure. In the 4th century, as I talked about, Greece had become so competitive and it so advanced in its physical training for its Olympics, so to speak, the people were, their names were changed to be called gymnasts. These gymnasts had specialized coaches. These men who were athletes called gymnasts were doing all sorts of training with, with coaches, with even special diets, 
all sorts of modern concepts which we use today all the way back then. In fact, they had four-day cycles, so to speak, that uh, they had a cycle of training so that if they followed this cycle, they would get stronger over time and not get weaker. For instance, day one was a day of preparations, short, high-intensity workouts. Day two would be a day of intense workouts. Day three, a day of resting. And day four, a day of medium intensity. Now, I'll say all this to you. This doesn't really mean much to y'all. But it does for me because my son, Noah, who is in 10th grade, is preparing to run his second marathon. Last year, he ran a marathon down in Atlanta. And I'll brag, he won first place. He was only in ninth grade. And for his age group, he ran a marathon in three hours and 34 minutes and got first place <laughs> in Atlanta. And it's not an easy marathon. It's got lots of steep hills from beginning to end. And in only in ninth grade, he in his age group, from whatever it is up to ninth, uh, 19 years age, of age, he was only 14, and he won first place. His second marathon is in just a couple weeks here in Charlotte. It's called Thunder Road. And so for the past 18 weeks, according to the Hal Hignan um, training regimen, He's been doing a certain amount of mileage each day. He does, he has rest days, and each week he's progressively running more and more miles. So over a period of 18 weeks, it climaxes with running his marathon, even to the point of having weeks where you train intensely and then weeks where you back off. So all this training regimen is, is nothing new. Even down to the diet, what people would eat, along with developing term, uh, programs and strength, strengthening exercises, the Greeks introduced special diets, fruits, vegetables, grains, and primarily they uh, now meat wasn't something regularly that they could have, but because they were wealthy and because they had coaches, they were, they were able to get access to meat. They didn't have the protein gels and they didn't have all the science and technology that we have today. But yet when you go back and you think of the training that was involved with becoming an athlete physically to win these races, and we take that paradigm and we apply it to the Christian life, how does that compare to your life and being godly? You know, my son, my sons, and many people can't make that jump from the physical training to the spiritual training. But if the encouragement is to run the race to win, to win the prize, the crown of life that is set before us, what are we doing if our race, if our lives are likened to a race? What are we doing to be sanctified, to be holy, to be strengthened in Christ so that when the day that the race comes and we have to jump those hurdles or we might have to participate uh, in such a, a, a race where we have to jump over a, a, a long jump over a puddle of water, so to speak, or we might have to jump over rocks, we might have to jump over all sorts of spiritual hurdles that might come our way. How are we prepared for that? even to the point of diet, even to the point of changing what you eat and drink, how you live your life. Paul said to the Ephesians in chapter 4, he uses this word, put off and put on. Now that Paul says to the Ephesians, now that we realize that Jesus has done all this for you, how should you live? Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, this language is very clear that now that you are walking with Christ, now that you are walking in His footsteps, now that you realize your life is a race, Essentially, what does that mean? That God is directing your life. God has got a course set out for you from beginning to end. He knows the whole thing. It's a part of his plan. He's in control of it. 
Now you who were once a slave to sin, but now have been set free, as Paul said to the Romans, and now become a righteousness, but now you have to go into strict training. You have to grow up from the milk of the word and now start eating meat. You need to grow up and mature and start building your muscles. Start practicing the distance. Extend your distances. Watch your knees. Watch your hips. Watch your form. You see, all these are things that runners have to do and athletes have to do to be careful. Injuries. Put off your old self and put on the new self. Then he says, throw off specifically the sin that so easily entangles. He said to Timothy in chapter 2, after he encouraged them to endure hardships as a soldier, athlete, and a farmer, those three paradigms, he goes on to say in verse 22, flee, here's the same word, kind of like the putting off and the putting on. What, what goes into training? You've got to transition from the old man to the new man. And the new man, the spiritual man, the godly man, or woman, so to speak, needs to throw off the sin. Flee the evil desires of youth. The old, way, old ways. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In the book of Galatians, chapter 5, we have um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that we should be pursuing. These are the things that should exemplify our lives, the fruit of the Spirit. Instead, where once before we exemplified in the past, before Christ was in our life and had control of our life and we realized we were running a spiritual race, we used to exemplify fruits of the world. We manifested ungodliness. But now, we're called to flee and to turn away and to run with perseverance, to run an enduring race, Keep on keeping on. How do we do this? Not only do we begin to train ourselves spiritually speaking, but more and more Paul encourages the people to look to Christ. And here the author of Hebrews does the same. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal, Paul said to the Philippians, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are, are perfect, have this same attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. In our text, he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So not only let us throw off everything that hinders us, but let us positively fix our eyes on Jesus. You've got to have a goal in your life. What is that prize? It's the same prize that Jesus had. Look at the text. The text says here, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him. Jesus himself had a goal. Jesus himself had a prize. What was it? It was obedience to his heavenly Father's will. It was conquering sin and death for us. So it was not only done to his Father, but it was for us as well. To be in heaven and to have us be with him in heaven as it was originally designed in the garden. That was Jesus' prize. He had a goal that caused him to endure suffering, to endure the cross, and to scorn its shame. What is our prize? 
Jesus is our prize to be with Him. If He was born, lived, died, and then rose again for us, our goal is to fulfill His purposes and to be with Him forever. You see right here in our text, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus has saved us for a purpose. He's the author of our faith, just as he was in the past for all those men and women who were faithful. He's got a purpose for you in your life. Even though he's allowing hardships in your life, which he goes on, we're not going to talk about it this time, but even though he talks about hardships as a discipline, God is allowing hardships in our lives so that we would shine brighter. We would be refined and be a brighter light because God uses dis hardships in our lives as a purifier, like a fire to purify the gold. God is the author of your life, and he's bringing you down a path. He's helping you to run a race for his glory and for the witness of, to not the present, but all those people who are going to follow, who are going to look to you in the, in the future and remember your example. You know, I think of all the books on my shelves. I think of pictures. You know, today we have so much technology that we didn't have 50 years ago or 100 years ago. You might have an old, what is it, 9 millimeter, 8 millimeter film of your parents or your grandparents, you might have one. I've got some pictures of my dad who was born in 1917 when he was in the war. He flew in Africa for um, the Army Air Corps and whenever he would go somewhere he would take the camera out of the, uh, the gunner's camera whenever they shot the, the, the machine guns in the, in the bombers, he, like I said he was in Africa, um, they would take those cameras and they would make home movies with them. And we actually have some of those home movies that my, of my dad before he married my mom out in the desert in Africa. They're awesome. They're so cool. That's about the extent of memories that we have of seeing our, our loved ones, our parents before us. And then we have history of genealogies that maybe the Mormons or someone else has gone to all the legwork. We have tombstones where people have... Um, you know, essentially gone to all uh, burial grounds and um, cemeteries and they've, you know, charted out all uh, who's there and what's said there so you can find your history, right? What do we have today? Today we have not only technology, but we have pictures, we have cameras. We're saving everything. I've got sh books on my shelves that are representative of what I believe. Some one of my kids are going to get those. But we also have pictures of me. We have stories of me. My life, or the lives of my children and your grandchildren, are not going to be forgotten because it's all preserved in an iCloud somewhere by technology. You're not going to be forgotten. Pictures of you are going to be found. We're going to know your life. That is a witness and a testimony. If God is the author for our lives, He has set a race for us so that we would be a witness to those who are in the future are even going to be able to look at your life. What does, if you were to watch a movie of your life, what would it say about your life? Does it say that your eyes are fixed on Jesus? Does it say that your gaze is upon him? That you contemplate Jesus' life? Do the notes in your Bible when your grandchildren or someone in your life gets your home Bible, your personal Bible, does it show that your life is fixed on Jesus Christ? Are they going to remember the testimony that you gave to them that Jesus is the author and perfecter of their lives and that they need to turn from their sin? Are they going to remember you cornering them and telling them you need Jesus Christ? Are they going to remember that? As awkward as that is, they will remember. It was because my grandmother told me or my grandfather told me that I need Jesus, that I came to Christ. It, came, it happened. It bore fruit in my life. Are they going to see that you lived 
and that you trained and that ultimately you died for Christ because of that joy set before you. And even on your dying day, with great expectation and, you, and hope, you look forward to going and being with the Lord. That is a witness. And that's the whole pur purpose. He's encouraging us. Consider Him. The final verse, verse 3. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see, the whole point here is to endure such opposition from sinful man so that the righteous will be encouraged, so that the sinful people who are persecuting you will see and say, just as the Roman soldiers did to Jesus because you were walking in his footsteps, surely she or he was a righteous person, a godly man and woman because of the testimony of your life and how you lived and died for Christ. You see, the world thinks of running a marathon as something physical. And they think that that's the fulfillment of life. My son right now, I hope he'll be able to make this transition, this jump from training to win the marathon to training to win the life for Christ. There are many races that we run in this life. Many enduring trials that we have to go through. But those are all lessons for us to persevere in the true life that we're living, the spiritual life that we're living. Have you ever asked yourself the question, life has got to be more than just this physical existence? If we're on the radio today, I'm not really sure if we will be or not, but I think we all come to that point in our lives where we have to say, what is the point of my physical existence. And maybe sometimes you ask yourself that even in your older age. In the golden years of your lives, you're asking yourself, what is the point of my life? The point of your life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And you do that by living according to His Word and being a witness to those who are around you, both the unrighteous and the righteous alike, of the truth of the gospel that you believe in your heart. That is the purpose of your life. And you do it with joy. Paul said to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Even in the midst of suffering. Even as you endure hardships. There is joy waiting for us. Having Heaven is waiting for us. And what gives us joy is the deposit He's put in our hearts. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for keeping us, for causing us to persevere, for using the circumstances that we go through in this life to refine us, to make us stronger, to be a means of training in our lives. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have not left us alone, that you are not done with us yet. We might be physically weak. We might be older. We might have gray, gained gray hair. We might not be in the workforce. We might have physical ailments and not be able to run a marathon. But you, Father, are not finished with us, and we thank you for that. We thank you that even though we are short-sighted, you can see perfectly into the future and to your purposes for us, laid out for us, that you are still working and changing us in accordance with your will. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And keep up the work in us, Holy Spirit. As hard as it is, Holy Spirit, and as how much, how much we complain, and we don't want to wake up and early and train, and we don't want to do the exercises, and we don't want to endure. Keep prodding us along. Do not give up on us, God, when we are hopeless, when we are tired, when we want to give up. Don't give up on us, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the reminder that we're living as a witness 
not only of the past and the faith of our forefathers, but even for the future, for those who are coming after us. And I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would work in each one of our lives so that those people who are coming after us, beginning with our family members, would remember our lives and us being Christians. I pray for each one of us here at Hephzibah, specifically, Lord, that our family members would know that we love Jesus. And if there's any question about that, Lord, I pray that you would prod us to share our faith and to encourage our loved ones and our family members to trust Christ, to give their lives to Jesus, to surrender all and follow after him. And use that to be a witness to them of our Christian witness. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are discomforted and mourning, who have cancer. Father, many who are sick and ailing and who are at the end of the race, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that you would cause them not to give up hope, but in that hour, as you said, to stand, to put on the full armor of God because we realize that the life we're living is a spiritual battle and to stand. Help them, Father, to stand until Jesus comes and takes them home. Father, I pray specifically for Steve and I ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would heal him of his brain cancer. And I pray, Father, that the test that, ha that comes out on Thursday uh, would be uh, positive, that is, in the respect that <clears throat> uh, the chemo and the radiation and all that's happening is uh, working. And I pray, Father, that you would use your mighty power to reverse that cancer in his brain. Encourage him and strengthen him to continue living and trusting in your strength. And for all those Lord else who have cancer and who are despairing even in these last days, may they look to Jesus and find their strength in him to endure. And in those quiet moments of the night, Father, you would speak to them and remind them of your love that you would open their eyes to see Jesus' smiling face, his nail-scarred hands and his side, and that they would be encouraged. That they would remember all the mighty works and accomplishments that God has done in their lives in the past. All the miracles that he has done, that they would be lifted up and encouraged in these last days. I pray, Father, that they would remember through the church and the letters and maybe the reading of the Word or the radio or the TV, maybe even in their mind you would bring back to them memories of the Bible and the stories of old, of those who've had to endure the Hall of Fame of the faithful so that they too would be encouraged to persevere. Father, I pray for these last days for the church in these last days, that you would cause her to rise up and be a bright light, a bright light and a witness to a dark world, to America who is sliding in her greatness to the, to the depths, that the church would rise up and be a leader and restoring and restoring and restoration of its greatness, of its morality, of its godliness, of pointing to you in whom we trust, O oh Lord our God. Use the church, we pray, in Jesus' name to make a difference at home, in the world, abroad. And we pay this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let us sing our hymn of response, number 539. My faith looks up to thee. Please stand.